All right, please take your Bibles with me this evening and turn to Luke 18. Luke 18 in your Bibles. The Impossible Made Possible is the title of the message. Luke 18, we'll begin in verse 18 this evening. Luke 18 has been for us a bit of a theological journey. It began with a call to persevering prayer, examined as we considered the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow woman. Jesus then at the end of that parable asked a question, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? This bridged the gap to our time together last week, where we considered the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, whose prayers reflected respectively self-righteousness and humility. Jesus says that only one of those men walked away justified, the one who humbled himself before the Lord. For indeed, as Jesus would often say, and the epistles often say as well, everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We continue this evening very much in that context. Don't forget that last week Jesus was speaking to a group of people who were self-righteous and despised others. Don't forget Jesus' call to humility and to acknowledgement of our own sinfulness. Don't forget the grace of God manifest through Christ on the cross. All of this will inform our understanding of the interaction between Jesus and a certain ruler this evening. This leads us into our text today where in verse 18 we read this, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This certain ruler is a Jew, as we will find as we continue throughout the context. We will also find that this ruler is quite genuine in his question, as opposed to the Pharisees, who are regularly thinking up questions intended not to be genuine, but rather to entrap Jesus, to lower his estimation in the eyes of others. I believe it's safe to assume that this man has a genuine question and he is in a place of genuine desire to know. Now, we at Legacy Baptist Church don't necessarily put too much emphasis upon the Reformation. We would not believe the Baptist traditions to be a product of the Reformation. Indeed, the Reformers persecuted our Baptist forebearers, the Anabaptists, in very much the same manner as the Catholic Church did. However, we must acknowledge that there is no evangelical or fundamental Christian tradition today that is not in some way, shape, or form a beneficiary of Reformation thinking. And one of those Reformation thoughts that has influenced the world so much is the idea of faith alone. Naturally, then, when we hear the question asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, we might bristle a bit. But really, we don't need to. But here is what we know. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus' answer, as it is going to come up here in the next little while, is not an answer that is intended to teach us that there is some works basis for salvation. What he is going to do instead is he is going to draw this certain ruler out where he is. He is going to draw this ruler out in an understanding that this ruler thinks there is something he can do to get to heaven. And as we'll see, he actually thinks he meets the qualifications of sinless perfection until Jesus makes it very clear that he does not. Jesus is trying here to get the man lost. He's not attempting to tell the man that he will actually be saved by works, much rather by faith. And we'll see that as we walk through. So then the certain ruler asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, 
this way in verses 19 and 20. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus begins by asking a, a, an interesting question. Why callest thou me good? This is not a rebuking question, not a how dare you call me good. There's only one good and that's God. Indeed, if this were the tone, and for, for a long time I thought this was the tone, it leaves a grand question mark in our minds because we know that Jesus has admitted and will admit several more times and the scriptures make it very clear that Jesus is a part of the, the triune Godhead, that Jesus is God. So for him to question this man about calling him good on the basis that only God is good and so why would Jesus be called good doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? But that's not the tone. That's not the manner of Jesus's question here. The tone is not rebuking, how dare you call me good, only God is good, but rather a inquiry. Why did you just call me good? And the reason for this inquiry is to be well observed in the following verses, that Jesus knows this ruler's heart. He knows this ruler does not regard him necessarily as God. This ruler regards him as a teacher. And as a teacher, he is either good or he's bad. And Jesus is emphasizing the idea here that all goodness comes from God. You just called me a good teacher, Jesus says. And there is none good but God, which means you are implying that I, as a good teacher, am from God. Why did you just call me a good teacher? Why did you just call me good master? Any goodness that you and I have is only to the degree that it reflects the character of God. To that end, our goodness is only God's goodness in us. And if this ruler sees, Jesus, uh, sees in Jesus God's goodness, as he should, since Jesus is God, then we would expect that this ruler would take the words of this good master to heart, that he would accept them as words from God, that he would not uh, be skeptical of the words of the good master because the good master is good and there is none good but God. So Jesus is not curious as to why he called, uh, this man called him good because for some reason Jesus feels as though he should not be called good. Jesus is curious as to why this man calls him good specifically because of this man's disposition toward him. How could you both call me good, admitting I'm from God, and then also perhaps question my teaching? So Jesus continues with his response then, and he says this, Thou knowest the commandments. You know what you must do to enter the kingdom. You must keep all the commandments. You must be sinlessly perfect. And he lists five of the Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. That word being more specifically in the Greek and Hebrew, murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Lying about the actions of another. And honoring your father and mother. Jesus gives five of the ten uh, ones which have a basis in moral action. And Jesus is not wrong here. Last week, we considered in our message together Romans 3. And there we learned that by the deeds of the law, no man is justified. But we made special note of the fact that this is not because the law is insufficient. It's not because the law failed that no man is justified in God's sight, but rather because man fails at keeping the law. Man is incapable. Therefore, yes, the law fails in, in uh, uh, accomplishing its purpose, but not because the law is flawed, but because mankind is so flawed, he can't keep the law. Indeed, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So Jesus' answer is not wrong here by any means. In fact, the answer is the answer that the law gives. But as we see throughout the New Testament, this answer is intended not to cause man to say, oh, okay, if I need to keep the commandments, then I can do that but rather it's intended to cause a man to realize just how far short he falls. He's supposed to say not, okay, I'm good, but rather, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. There must be some other way or else I have no hope. But notice this certain ruler's response. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth. 
So the ruler is listening. Jesus says, in order to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be perfect before the law. And the rulers, mm -hmm, mm hmm yep, commit adultery, honor father and mother. Yep, okay, that's good, check. What else? And you might see Jesus, if you were there, just his eyes cross for a moment as he thinks, wow, this man just said that he, he's got it all down, that he's done all of these things. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get that, that he's a sinner. Uh, he doesn't get it. He hasn't perhaps heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. But even aside from that, to say that he's never dishonored his parents, uh, these sorts of things, wow, what a claim, what a statement. But what is interesting about this, now Jesus is obviously not surprised, right? Jesus knows the hearts of men. But what's interesting about this is that Jesus doesn't just rebuke him here. Instead, he adds to the scenario to help this man realize that he doesn't really get what he's saying, that he's not really as good as he thought he thinks he is. Look at verse 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Oh, good. I'm glad that you've kept the commandments. But I think you're missing one thing that you need to get to the kingdom. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So we mentioned Jesus doesn't rebuke the ruler for his confusion. Uh, he doesn't even really refute his confusion. He assumes the man to be genuine, but knowing this ruler's heart, he knows that this man has a particular weakness, and that weakness is that he loves money. So he simply replies, okay, just one more thing to do. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. Lay up your treasure in heaven instead of on earth and come and follow me. Once again, we know that this is not a requirement for a man to be saved. He doesn't have to be poor to be saved. But if a man is unwilling to place the promise of the gospel above his love for the things of this world, then he has not received the gospel. We'll talk more about this as Jesus hits on it. We read of the man's response in verse 23. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. The man was very sad when he heard this because he was a rich man and he loved his riches. While he was willing to temper his morality, while he was willing to conform his actions to some basis of morality in order to get to the kingdom of heaven, when the kingdom of heaven asked of him the things that he truly loved in this earth, he perhaps never, uh, like, like many second and third generation Christians, Perhaps he'd never really built into himself a love for covetousness or for stealing or uh, a, a habit of disobeying his parents, those sorts of things because of maybe good discipline in the home and, and a good environment and, and such. But what he had not done <laughs> was develop a love for God that compelled him to love God above everything. He had simply found his outlet for loving the world, not in covetousness, found his outlet for loving the world, not in disobedience to parents, but he had found his outlet for loving the world in money. And he wasn't prepared to temper his greed and his love of money for the sake of the kingdom. And so we read, verses 24 and 25, when Jesus saw that he was sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus sees the ruler's reaction that he is wrestling between his love for money and his love for God, that there is a battle in his heart over the priorities of this life and the priorities of the life to come. And he tells those listening, how hardly shall the, those with riches enter into the kingdom of God. It's a difficult thing. It's an uphill battle for the wealthy to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And not just the wealthy. We'll talk in just a few moments. The wealthy, the honorable, the powerful, the intelligent. In fact, Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I'd like to take a moment and park on this concept, to park on this statement. There are many people who have been confused over this statement because the plain reading of the concept is so fantastic that people have sought for some other explanation. And there have been many explanations given as to what this might mean. The most plausible, though one that I still disagree with, 
is found in Lord Nugent's Lands Classical and Sacred, who mentions that in some modern Syrian towns, the narrow gate for foot passengers at the side of the large gate where bigger things would enter was known as the needle's eye. In order to get through it, particularly if a camel were going to get through it, all of the baggage would have to be removed from the camel and he'd have to crouch down and he'd have to scoot himself through if you were going to get a camel through this needle's eye. So the idea being is it parallels that you would have to lay aside your burdens and enter in only by yourself. There are, uh, th th that's the idea. And many have committed themselves to this interpretation. And that's fine. I'm not fully convinced of it for several reasons. First, it's very uncertain whether or not this term for a little gate, a needle's eye, was known in ancient times. There is no reference to such a gate in any ancient manuscript or in any ancient description of a city. The question becomes, was it called the needle's eye because of this par parable? Or was Jesus giving this parable because they knew of the needle's eye? We see no reason to believe that anyone knew of a needle's eye gate at that time in history. Second point is, as we'll see as we continue through the passage, the disciples will say, who can be saved? And Jesus will say, it is impossible. Jesus is not saying that as long as you lay aside enough, you can scoot yourself through the gate. Jesus is saying it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Furthermore, I'd like us to think more broadly. I'd like to make this a broader application for a moment to give you a perspective. I'd like to exhort you to always be cautious when your understanding of a Bible teaching requires you to know some element of culture that the Bible does not teach. God wrote the lessons of the Bible to be timeless. And while certain elements of history and of culture in the Bible no doubt demand knowledge outside the Bible to fully understand or appreciate, I do not believe that God would apply the same standard to the teachings of the Bible. That a person could not open the Bible, read a teaching, and understand the importance of the teaching without knowing some history. The Bible is a self-contained revelation meant to be timeless. In other words, it makes sense that I would need to go outside of the Bible to understand perhaps the context of history as, as the Bible, uh, within which the Bible relates. If I needed to know more about the Babylonian Empire or the Egyptian Empire or the Persian Empire in order to understand maybe the geopolitics or whatever um, and to understand where Daniel fits in or Moses fits into that, obviously I'd have to go outside of the Bible. But it does not make sense that God would require anything other than his word to understand his teachings. That an important teaching such as this, that it is hard for rich people to get into the kingdom of heaven, one of the most important and one of the, 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 the um, most obvious teachings on wealth in the Bible, and God is going to require us to have read a book that wasn't even published until thousands of years after Jesus spoke in order to understand it. And see, there's no mention in the Bible of a needle gate, even though Nehemiah is pretty thorough talking about the gates of the city in Jerusalem in his day. While there are many culturally specific teachings found, particularly in the Gospels, they remain relevant because the Bible explains them so that we can understand the teachings' relevance. So we understand the relevance of Jesus plucking the corn and calling himself the Lord of the Sabbath because we have the Old Testament to teach us the Sabbath laws, the foundation for that. We understand the relevance of Jesus allowing the harlot to wash his feet and speaking to Simon the Pharisee about that because we understand Pharisees and we understand the law as it relates to harlots. We understand the relevance of Jesus' actions with the Samaritans. The Good Samaritan parable, the Samaritan woman, not just because of what the New Testament tells us, but because of what we can read about the Samaritans in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and in Ezra and Nehemiah. In each of these cases, there's a historical context which will, can help us. 
If I dig into the history of the Pharisees and how they came about during the intertestamental period, if I dig into the history of the Samaritans and, and their interaction with the Jews during the intertestamental period, if I dig into uh, the, the elements of um, the 613 laws that were uh, established in the Jewish code and all of these, these different elements, then I can learn more. If I go to the Torah, uh, if I go, excuse me, to the Tanakh and the Mishnah and such, I can learn more. But I don't need them to understand. The Bible gives me enough in the Bible to understand these teachings and how they relate to me. But if we must know history simply to have a context for teaching, that makes me skeptical. And to that end, while cultural idea of a needle's gate, needle's eye gate, is interesting, I actually am not convinced. It could very well be that Jesus was speaking about a camel going through the eye of a needle, a sewing needle. They have a loop at the end for the thread. And in fact, in many ways, I'm more comfortable with this historically than I am with the needle's eye gate. Because if we do look back in the Talmud, which were writings that explained as a compilation of teachings on law and tradition, twice in the Talmud, it references an elephant passing through the eye of a needle. And so this concept is not unfounded in Jewish teaching. The concept was something which was literally impossible to represent something which was figuratively unlikely to take place. And personally, I'm more comfortable with this being a very accessible Near Eastern proverb than necessarily a cultural distinctive. Either way, however, let's glean the point. It is difficult for rich people to enter into the kingdom. Now, we mentioned this context just in passing last week. Let's settle some of the gospel's teaching as it relates to the wise, the powerful, the rich, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'd like us to first go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul writes in verses 19 through 29, a bigger chunk of scripture here. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified." Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called." God hath but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So last week we mentioned that God's economy is an economy of humility. That weakness, meekness, deference, humility, submission, this is the currency with which God operates. As such, there is a natural conflict that arises in the heart of those who have great loyalty to the things of this world. For the very ambitious, what happens when the gospel comes into conflict with your ambition? I'm not saying that you can't believe the gospel and be ambitious, but when the gospel and your ambition actually come into conflict, and you have to either set aside the gospel or you have to set aside your ambition, which one will you choose? Because you can't have both. For the very powerful, what happens when the gospel comes into conflict with your power? Which will you choose if you can't have both? For the very popular, what happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into conflict with your popularity? Which will you choose if you can't have both? For the very intelligent, what happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into conflict with your intelligence? Which will you choose if you can't have both? And for the very wealthy, what happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into conflict with your wealth? 
Which will you choose if you can't have both? Paul tells us in regard to might, nobility, and wisdom what Jesus tells us in regard to wealth. That those who have the greatness of this world will have a harder time yielding it for the future promises, the invisible promises of the kingdom. That the battle of faith is fought more violently in the hearts of those who have more to lose by yielding their loyalty to this world. But all who stand in heaven one day, whether they were rich or poor, whether they were great or mighty, all who stand in heaven one day will stand there by faith, lest any man should boast. And if no flesh will be able to glory in his presence, then it stands to reckon that those who get there must yield their right to have glory if they are going to get to heaven. So that no man will be able to say, I got to heaven for my might. I got to heaven because of my intelligence. I got to heaven because of my riches. To this end, James writes in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the days of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. James here links the condition to the actual problem. The problem is not riches by any means. The problem is that they trust in their riches. It's not that you have money. It's when money has you. The problem is when your riches are used to oppress instead of to bless. When your riches have made you more a child of the devil than a child of God. The legacy of wealth in history is really one that has gone two ways those who use their wealth to bless others and those who use their wealth to oppress others. And while both have always existed, the greater legacy of the wealthy has always rested in oppression, not blessing. The greater legacy of the wealthy has always been selfishness, not selflessness. And James warns that those who fulfill this stained legacy live in pleasure on this earth at the expense of the world that is to come. They put their love upon this world and this world is what they inherit. Only this world is fallen, corrupted, temporal, and passes away, which means all that they inherit will pass away. So it is that those who place their love in the things of this life not only place their love on that which is temporary and fitted to judgment, but they do so at the expense of the greater riches found in God through God's currency. Humility, charity, peace, generosity, obedience. In what is one of the most well-known passages in the Bible on wealth, Paul warns Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6-10, through 10, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some having coveted, uh, some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. As we have regarded many times, it is not being rich that is the problem, but the will to be rich the compulsion to pursue riches. It is not money that is the problem. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Those who will be rich fall into hurtful lusts, fall into snares, that on the day that you have a choice to make, more riches or your integrity, there is a real possibility that if you love money and if you will be rich, you will choose money over integrity. And at this point, you've put yourself on the wrong side of God. And one of the problems 
with the rich and the mighty and the powerful and the honorable and the intelligent is that they don't like being told that the gospel transcends their wealth or their power. One of these problems is that the gospel tells them that they have a need that they can't throw money at to get to, get to go away. You can't just get to the pearly gates, say, am I on the list? And they say, nope, sorry, you're, on, you're not on the list. And they pop down a couple Benjamins. Well, am I on the list now? It doesn't work that way. The powerful are not going to get to heaven and they say, you're not on the list. The Lamb's Book of Life is open. Your name's not in it. And you say, well... Open a history book and you'll find that my name ought to be on the list. It's not going to work that way. Your power, your honor, your might, your intelligence, your money has no power with God. It's not a currency in which God deals. God deals in the currency of humility, submission, obedience. So the idea here, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And in our minds we think, wow, this is really hard. If everyone who is noble, mighty, wise, wealthy will face a major uphill battle in this world, then who can be saved? Especially as we think about the United States. The United States, even the poorest among us, are rich by world standards. In the United States, even the poorest among us, by certainly history standards, are very wealthy, have a very high standard of living. There's food aplenty. There's places to live. Infant mortality rates are low. In the last 20 years, the world poverty rate has plummeted. This whole world, in some sense, is getting to the point where they have what they need. So then who can be saved? Really, only the dumbest, the poorest, and the weakest among us? Is the kingdom really that exclusive? Is it really that elusive? This is what the disciples were thinking. Look at verse 26. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? If this is true, if it is so unlikely that the wealthy will enter the kingdom of heaven, who can be saved? Note Jesus' answer in verse 27. He said, These things which are impossible with men, are possible with God. If it were just up to the rich man to objectively evaluate the promises of the material as opposed to the promises of the, of the, the spiritual and make his decision, it would be impossible. If it were just up to the wise men to objectively look at the evidence of the physical as opposed to the evidence of the promises of the immaterial and to make a decision for Christ it would be impossible. If it were just up to the mighty men to objectively see the benefits of submitting to the greater might of God, it would be impossible. If it were just up to the noble man to be ready to lose his nobility in this world to gain a kingdom that he cannot see, it would be impossible. But here's the thing. God is a God of the impossible. It isn't just up to us, is it? It is not up to me to establish my own righteousness. There is a God that is bigger than me. God is not just a passive Savior who only points the way. Jesus did not come to point the way to salvation. Jesus came to lead the way to salvation. God is active in the process of leading others to him. And he calls the wealthy just as he calls the poor. And he calls the mighty just as he calls the weak. And it might be easier for the weak man to hear that call and say, I need that because they have nowhere else to go. And it might be easier for that poor man when he hears the call to say, I want that because he has no promise of riches in this life. But that doesn't mean Jesus isn't calling the wealthy, the powerful, the mighty, the intelligent. And because of that, there is a possibility because what is impossible with man is possible with God. John 12, 32 Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus is drawing men. And for this reason, if you have in your mind somebody today that you've put on the mental impossible list, 
You've given the gospel. They don't want it. They're hard. They're cold. They're stubborn. They're stern. They don't want to hear it. They've rejected it. They don't want you to mention it anymore. May I tell you this? It's not impossible with God. Pray for them. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. And our God is a God of miracles. It is overcomable through the power of the God of all flesh. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And a loving God who aches to see all men saved. So that 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There is indeed great hope of salvation, even among those who might be considered least likely, even among those who have an uphill battle to receive it, or among those who have the biggest hurdles to clear. Now at the tail end of this teaching, the disciples are very introspective. And Peter, ever the thoughtful one, speaks up in verse 28. We read this. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. We didn't hold on to our wealth. We literally left our nets and fishes lying on the boat and we came and followed you. Now in light of what we have just heard Jesus say about inheriting the kingdom of heaven, we might expect Jesus to simply look at them and say, and you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. You'll inherit the kingdom of God. You have left all and followed. You followed me. That's the condition. But this isn't really the focus of Jesus' response. Notice verses 29 and 30. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Jesus says, to whatever degree a man yields the priorities of this life for the priorities of the next, not only will he inherit eternal life, and take note here, the King James translation says, the world to come, that word world, not an incorrect translation by any means, but it is a word that we would better understand today with the word age. It's a period of time. It's the passing of one epoch in history to another epoch in history, one age to another age. In the age to come, we will receive everlasting life. But notice, he speaks more about this age. This present time, in this life, he will also inherit, inherit manifold more than what he gave up. That the man who is willing to give what he has in this life to yield it, doesn't mean God's going to take it, but the man who is willing to yield all that he has in this life will be given back more than he could have ever imagined. Now take note that Jesus is not saying here that a, being a follower of Jesus Christ is incompatible with having family or loving your family. He's not calling for them to abandon their earthly commitments or he's not promising them that they will lose their earthly commitments. But he's saying that whoever will put the things of men's desires in this life underneath his priority to the life to come, God will not only bless him with eternal life, but God will bless him with contentment. God will bless him with things in this life that he or she could have never imagined. Now, for the sake of clarity on this teaching, let's go to the Mark parallel passage. This Mark parallel passage is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's very precious to me. It is the passage through which God confirmed my call to ministry. And Jesus is recorded saying this in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Notice in this account, it's a parallel account, but there are a few differences, uh, that the promise is an hundredfold of those very things that you gave up. But notice also that Jesus mentions here that with these promises are, is a promise of accompanied persecution. Jesus is not promising health, wealth, and happiness to those who will yield the things of this life for the things of the next. 
But what he is promising is a complete and sufficient emotional replacement for everything you think you're yielding in this life for your loyalty to Christ. So what does this look like? Well, we mentioned already, it doesn't mean that he isn't allowed to have things, that the man who yields isn't allowed to have things. It only means that he has put Christ and the gospel above these things. So if the choice came to follow Christ or maintain a good relationship with my family, I follow Christ. If the choice comes to follow Christ or keep my comfortable standard of living, I follow Christ. If the choice comes to following Christ or staying in the United States, I follow Christ. If the choice comes to following Christ or having a great job, I follow Christ. But it may be, and indeed often is, that I can follow Christ and have these things as well. The problem is only when, for the sake of these things, I yield Christ, his, following his will, following his word. Or in the case of much of the unbelieving world, for the sake of the things of this world, I actually yield the gospel. Now, what does it mean? that the man who yields these things will receive a hundredfold now in this time with persecutions leading up to everlasting life in the ages to come. The only thing I can do is give you a testimony of me. I really don't know how to relate this any other way. I believe we could go to mother missionary biographies and see the idea. When I was called the Legacy Baptist Church, when my wife and I committed ourselves to this place, it was with great sacrifice from the perspective of the world. And again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here or anything of the sort. But my wife and I knew that this was the place that God wanted us. But we were asked to come to a state where neither of us had ever lived. A state where, that is very far away from our families. And we're close to our families. My wife's family in Georgia, mine in Colorado. Without any promise of salary, we came up with, with, with a, a zero dollar promise of salary or provision from the church. It was very small at the time. It still is small, but it was very small then. And we had a choice to make. Do we come for the sake of the gospel, follow the will of the Lord, or do I go pursue a church somewhere else where maybe we can be closer to family, where maybe I can get a good salary. Do I continue on with my education? We chose to come. And so we lost a few things. The Lord has given us much back in provisions, but we lost some things. We yielded our family, blood family, but what has God given us in exchange for yielding those things? Well, he's given us a home, a family. And though we don't have my parents or her parents nearby, we have an entire church family that we count just as dear. This is the hundredfold family. Your houses are our houses. Our house is your house. Your family is my family. My family is your family. Your lands are my land. My land is your lands. This is how a church is supposed to be, at least. In the church, God has given us back everything that we lost physically and more, so much more. And that's the idea. No man gives these things up with life, in this life without receiving to him the family of God. Many fathers, many mothers, many brothers, many sisters, many children, many grandchildren... And what a joy it is. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be persecutions. That doesn't mean I might not lose some things materially, physically. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be on the wrong side of hate speech laws. Doesn't mean I'm not going to ever lose the things that I have because of my stand for Christ. But I rest in the confidence that I'm happier here in God's will than I could ever be closer to the things that I have in this life, yet yielding the will of God. And that's all I know because that's all I've experienced. But that is the message, that is the promise. Let's apply this evening. Several applications as we close. Number one, 
The kingdom of heaven is unattainable by man. You know this. I know this. We've talked about the gospel many a time. This certain ruler asks what he must do to inherit eternal life, and Jesus tells him what he must do, which is by every measurement impossible, that he must be sinlessly perfect. He must keep the law, which though this man apparently in his ignorance thought he had done a good job, he recognized quite quickly that he had fallen short of all of the elements of loving God in his heart because he had a love for money instead. And this leads us to the same inevitable conclusion that it led the disciples. If the tendencies of men lend themselves to fall short of the kingdom of God, who then can be saved? It's impossible on your own. You can't get yourself to heaven. You can't be saved. You can't save yourself. You can't earn it. You can't be worthy of it. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. And that is the message of the gospel, is it not? That you're a sinner, that you cannot get yourself to heaven, that you have fallen short, that you cannot be saved on your own merit. But God, through Jesus Christ, God sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day validating everything that he said, that he's alive today, that he offers eternal life to those who will believe in him, who will place their full faith and trust in the finished work of Christ to save them. I'm not trusting in my riches. I'm not trusting in my good works. I'm not trusting in my church. I'm not trusting in my merits. I'm not trusting that God will know my heart, that God will know my good intentions. I am trusting the fact that I can't get myself to heaven, that I am a sinner, but that God in his mercy sent Jesus Christ to pay for my sin, to take upon him Himself, that which I cannot pay, and I am flinging myself at his mercy to receive forgiveness. And so the impossible becomes possible, not just with God, but through God by means of his son, Jesus Christ. And the man who sees the impossibility of his condition and flings himself upon the mercy of God will be given that which he cannot earn or deserve. Point number two. Beware the snares of this world. We spent time growing in our understanding that it is not a sin to be wealthy or intelligent or to have a position of honor or power. However, we also considered carefully the warnings that these things, when they become the focal point of our life and pursuits, can bring. These things can become a snare to us and can hinder our capacity to follow Christ as we ought. Even for we who are in Christ and so have received the gospel with gladness, the world can become a snare to us. John warns in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The love of the world is not an in or out sort of a thing. I'm not either in the love of the world or I'm out of the love of the world. It's a spectrum of emotions and attachments. And to whatever degree the love of the world fills our heart, it is to that same degree that the love of the Father is not in us. And to whatever degree we love the Father and reject the love of the world is the degree to which the love of the world is not in us. To whatever degree we answer the call of the world in affection, to that degree our affection is taken from the Father and given to the world. Because as we learned way back in Luke, ye cannot serve God and mammon. So beware of all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, things that you that call you to the world and call you away from God. Beware of those things. Beware of the things in your life that are competing for your time. Whether, it, maybe it's television, maybe it's video games, maybe it's amusements, maybe it's fishing, maybe it's hunting, maybe it's spending money, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's gossip. Beware of things that call you away from prayer and the time in the word. Beware of things that call you away from the church and the assembling of believers. Beware of things that cause you to fail in the distinctives of the Christian life. And that would pressure you to give up that which you know is right. 
Beware of things which ask for your time and your talents and your resources that will divert you from Christ's will. Guard your heart from these things, but remember that many of these things are not wrong in and of themselves. Remember that any virtue can become a vice when it's out of balance. The key, the directive, is to keep things in their proper place, to keep God at the top. So that if God ever did say you need to yield that, you're ready to yield it. So that everything is on the table. That's the call. So let's ask the Spirit of God to search our hearts this evening. Take inventory of our own desires, priorities, and actions. Have we placed our love and loyalty upon anything or anyone to the expense of God's best for us? Maybe it's a relationship that you refuse to leave because the loyalty to that relationship is higher than that to God. Are there things in your heart or life which are compelling you to yield God's best. We spoke this morning of unforgiveness. Maybe it's unforgiveness, bitterness. You don't want to give it up. You want to seethe in your hatred, your anger, your bitterness toward that person. You won't give it up. It's drawing you away from the Lord. It's competing with the Lord. Only the Spirit of God can tell you if there's something wrong. Only the Spirit of God can tell you if elements of your life have begun to compete with God in your life. But if the Spirit of God has made something known, let's get it taken care of so that we can be in that right place with Him. And that leads us to our final point. Consider well the rewards of giving all to follow Christ. One of the middle verses of trust and obey says this, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Look, folks, faith always precedes blessing. On the authority of God's word, you cannot be happier than when you are fully yielded to Christ. This doesn't make sense that in order to have all, we must give all. It doesn't make sense that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. But this is the truth. This is God's way. This is God's economy. And it is not for us to question it. It is for us to believe it. That if you will take the steps to yield your will to God's will, that if you will lay all at the altar, and look, God's not going to give you the blessings first. It doesn't work that way. Faith precedes blessing. You cannot know what I'm talking about. You cannot know it by experience until you're willing to take the step. You've got to take the step. You've got to say, this is comp competing with you, Lord, and I'm putting you above it before you'll see just the, what blessings God has in store for you. And on the authority of God's word, any sacrifice you make for the Lord will be worth it. You will never regret it. I've said many times, I have never once in my life regretted yielding something for the sake of God. The only regrets I have are the times where I chose not to. Say, Pastor, you expect me to believe you? No, I expect you to believe God's word. But sometimes it helps to have an eyewitness. I'll be that. I'll be that one that tells you this works. It does. Oh, believe me, it does. But the faith comes first. Have you left all and followed Christ? Spouse, I'm not telling you to walk away from your family. Child, I'm not telling you to walk away from your family. I'm not telling you to sell your home and give away all your possessions, but I'm asking you, are you willing to not walk away from your family? But are you willing? What, what, what would happen if God took your family from you like Job? Is your family yielded? What would happen if God asked you for your house? What would happen if God asked you to sell all you have and go to the mission field? Would you do it? Are you yielded? I'm simply asking whether or not your heart is in a place where if God asked you to take, to yield any of those things, you would be willing to do so.
Is that where your heart is today? If not, would you put your heart there? Would you just yield? Would you just give up? Would you give in? Would you stop resisting? Would you stop wrestling for your way and for your rights and for your stuff? Would you yield all of that to God and say, God, I like this stuff. I want this stuff. But if you want it, I want you more. That's where blessing is found. And when God finally has you in your entirety, watch what he can do both for you and in you.